Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Wilson Zito. I'm a cardiac surgeon from Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining us today at the STS Annual Meeting Roundtable. Our topic today is latest therapy in mitral valve therapy. And there, there is a table here of esteemed colleagues uh, to talk about where we think the future of this therapy is going to be, and it's going to be exciting. So let's start off with some introductions around the table. Uh, I'm Mike Mack. I'm a cardiac surgeon uh, at Baylor Scott & White in Dallas. I'm Gilbert Tang. I'm a cardiac surgeon at Mount Sinai Health System. I'm Gaurav Alawadi. I'm a cardiac surgeon in Charlottesville, Virginia at the University of Virginia. Hey, I'm John Lashinger. I'm a, a cardiac surgeon and a uh, medical officer at the FDA in the structural heart device branch. Fantastic. So let's get right into it. And uh, as you can tell from the buzz and all the content uh, this year on TechCon, uh, on new technology, let's jump right into transcatheter mitral valve therapy. And Dr. Mack, you being or the pioneer in TAVR, uh, and now you see this new energy and all this activity in the space of TMVR replacement. Share with us, if you may, your perspective on where the field's going to be in three to five years, how it's going to impact cardiac surgery, and maybe give us your thoughts about similarities and differences between TAVR and TMVR. So, first of all, I would say that this is not TAVR redux. This isn't, you know, deja vu all over again. It probably is, but with a much longer timeline. Um, the valve is much more complex. The space is much more complex. The delivery is much more complex. And mechanistically, it's a different problem. You know, with aortic stenosis, you have a mechanical problem. You fix that, that problem, and the patient comes out of the procedure better than they went in. Um, the, I keep seeing all these uh, Wall Street estimates and industry estimates of the size of this market. And so far, despite being involved with it for five to seven years now, I don't see that, you know, patients aren't coming out of the trees for this anymore, mm -hmm. or, or yet. And um, I think we have, at least for secondary MR, which I think is the big potential application, uh, we haven't clearly proven that fixing secondary MR makes a difference. The trial's never been done in surgery. Uh, we do have a trial with MitraClip called the COAP trial, and I think that's going to be in very, form, very informative of the field of knowing whether it fixes it makes a difference. If it does, I think it is going to significantly catalyze um, the field. So um, I, I think it's an exciting area. We also have the repair versus replacement strategies. We do have the CTSN trial that we all participated in. That I think that will significantly inform who gets repaired and who gets replaced by a transcatheter approach. So I think it is exciting. It's not going to happen nearly as fast as TAVR. And I think at least in the early stages, uh, this is going for the most part transapical. And I do think that surgeons should embrace this and take a lead role in trying to figure this out. I think, I mean, those are great comments. Thank you. And I would love to get some comments around the table. But you brought up surgeons' involvement, engagement, and having the right skill set. As you mentioned early on, it is going to be transapical, likely, for the majority of these platforms. But I think at some point, it will likely be transeptal, I would think. For two physicians, Gorov and Gilbert, who have a lot of experience in transeptal techniques, what, what would you say to surgeons if they have an interest in this field and how would you get engaged and get the right skill set to do this? So I do think the, in my mind, transeptals are the exposure, the transcatheter exposure of the mitral valve. So surgeons need to, when they're doing open surgery, they need to start thinking about a, a transcatheter transeptal. So if they're ever looking at the septum, they're doing a tricuspid or a mitral, think about it. Uh, and, and think about where that transeptal would ideally want to be. There are now, I think, increasing mechanisms to learn how to do it, whether it's working at your own local site with your cardiologist, with your electrophysiologist, uh, to learn how to do transeptals. There's certainly been more active engagement at a societal level to get uh, uh, surgeons trained uh, how to do it. Industry has been very supportive about getting surgeons uh, involved. Gilbert and I ran a transeptal course for surgeons recently, and so um, I think there's now a more open, embracing uh, feeling from surgeons. Up till now, I think surgeons oftentimes thought this is a threat. You know, this is what the cardiologists are going to do, and they're going to take away from us. And I, I think 
um, there's been a, a gradual change and more of an embracing of these new technologies and realizing we, we, we're not going to give it up. It's part of the platform of treatment of structural heart and valve disease, and surgeons have every right to be at the table. Correct. And, and you know, there's been a lot of excitement. Uh, as you know, the STS uh, initiated a structural heart catheter-based course um, a, a year ago. The plan is that there will be one in December as well. Dr. Mackey, were part of that first one. So I think education is important. Gilbert, any comment from you in, in specific to that transeptal course that Gorov was referring to? Yeah, I, mean, I echo Gorov's point completely. I think surgeons need to be involved, and having transeptal skills is the first step in you know, being able to access to this technology. And working with your cardiologists uh, locally is one way through industries and another way. But I also would encourage people that if there's a mitral clip procedure done at your institution, see you can you know, set aside some time to go into the cath lab or the hybrid OR and at least watch the procedure and how it's done because I think just you learn a lot by watching and the imaging and interacting with the echocardiologist uh, and the uh, you know, structural interventionalist just to see how they do the procedure gives you some mechanism to show that you're interested. And I think that is a step in the right direction. Okay. Well, I want to take this opportunity to segue into something you had mentioned um, Mike, uh, is the repair replacement discussion, um, cat transcatheter, not just open. Um, Gorov, comments regarding uh, all the new exciting technology in addition to mitral clip that's currently available commercially. How do we position, how, how do we get the surgeons engaged and be prepared as this new round of new technology is going to be upon us soon? And can you share perhaps some of the the new technology that's out there um, and how it would um, impact cardiac surgery? So, well, for both transcatheter mitral replacement and repair, there's dozens of new technologies that are out there. Fortunately, uh, there are, a lot of them are coming to the U.S. for their early visibility and pivotal trials. So uh, instantly, surgeons will need to be involved. As you mentioned, a lot of them are transapical not just the TNVR, but the repair strategies. Uh, many of them are artificial cords uh, like uh, Neocord and Harpoon, and these are transapical devices right now. They're small devices, uh, but currently they still require an incision, and the surgeon really has to be uh, involved right from the start. I think the key aspect of all of these strategies is the imaging. And I know we've talked about that for TAVR, but really for mitral disease, it's at another level. And I do want to emphasize that Surgeons are already very comfortable with anatomy and imaging. They have to learn uh, a little differently um, for the mitral valve, but many, many surgeons who do a lot of mitral valve surgery are already looking at, at echo a lot. And uh, that's a distinction from many interventional cardiologists who now are shifting into structural heart disease. It's a different skill set than PCI. So not every excellent interventional cardiologists will necessarily do as well with structural heart disease if they don't have the echo and imaging background. I think surgeons are well poised for that. So um, whether it's, it's the transeptal as the exposure or transapical, the surgeons have every opportunity to be involved. Great point. Gilbert, I know you've had some experience with some of this technology already. Mm -hmm. As Goroff mentioned, this is mostly in the feasibility um, uh, status. Any comments regarding some of these new catheter-based therapy for repair platforms? I think the interesting about the repair platform is that they're not mutually exclusive. So I think what the companies are trying to look into is just like surgeons, we have different ways to repair a mitral valve. Transcatheter approach will be the similar. So that's the mitral clip that's approved, but there's also the cardio band, which is annual plastic band. That's the neocord or half one, which is quarter replacement. So what they're trying to mimic is basically a repair strategy that can be used in combination, not mutually exclusive of each other. So you can either do it in the same time or in a staged fashion. So you don't necessarily uh, basically box yourself in from other potential technologies, which I think is, that's what's exciting about in the repair space. I think the outcomes are still highly variable uh, and it's gonna take time for the technology to improve to get better outcomes, unlike a surgical repair, but it'll get there. John, I would love to get your input on this from the FDA perspective. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of excitement about these new technologies. From your perspective, what are some key takeaway points, not only for surgeons, but for physicians and patients? Well, we're excited about this technology, too, and it's really a challenge 
uh, for us, first of all, uh, to make sure that a lot of these studies, if not all of them, are done in the United States. And we have a lot of programs um, now in place to uh, ease the performance of early feasibility studies and pivotal trials in the United States. Um, and, um, and, uh, and hopefully we'll uh, continue to be creative as far as study design to make sure those studies get done. The challenge for us are going to be a couple, and that's the fact that, you know, we have to look at these disease entities separately from, for degenerative mitral regurgitation and functional mitral regurgitation. And uh, all these devices are going to try to be applied in both situations, and we have to figure out where they belong, where they're uh, best suited for. Um, and the second thing we have to do is try to um, judge some of them as part of a tool set that might be used together with other devices. So the cardio band, like, um, you know, if we extrapolate our surgical experience, um, the, uh, you know, simply reduction annuloplasty doesn't always work without adding something else, and this is certainly um, artificial cordae without annuloplasty may or may not work. Um, and uh, so when we have those technologies evaluated separately, um, it, it, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a very uh, challenging thing to, to look at in, a, in an objective way. So those, those are some of the challenges that we have going forward. Um, it's going to take cooperation with the medical community and the surgical community out there to design the best trials we can and, and to try to take all those things into account. Fantastic. Thank you for that perspective. In the remaining few minutes we have left, uh, let's touch a little bit about surgery. Uh, as most of us know, that is still the gold standard at this point. And surgery has very good results. But we're also innovating on the surgical side, minimal invasive robotics. Um, as a surgeon who does a lot of minimal invasive mitral surgery, your thoughts? Let's start with you, Goroff, about where the future of minimal invasive mitral valve surgery uh, as we work with technology and innovation, and what, what is, where, what is, what is going to be the place of valve surgery five, ten years from now? And I'd love to get everyone's thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good question and certainly an unknown. It all depends on how good these repair strategies are and how good the replacement strategies are. Um, ultimately, likely there'll need to be some different types of trials, potentially even head-to-head -head trials of mm -hmm. transcatheter therapies not necessarily to reinvent, but certainly we know with DMR, it appears there's there's a lot of data for surgery that repairs better, and it'll be interesting to see if that plays out on a transcatheter basis as well. Um, surgery is a gold standard. I think at least for the near to midterm future, that's going to stay that way. One of the things to emphasize is a lot of these trials with these new technologies are very limited what types of patients they're looking at because it's they're really looking at safety. and so. Mm -hmm there's a very high screen failure rate for both TMBR and repair. And, and if it gets approved or there's good data, how will that end up being broadened to the, the, the larger population that we often see surgically? The benefits of surgery are still that we can do so much more. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got many different tools. As Steve Bowling says, there's 27 different things I do to the mitral valve. Well, the, the fact is um, there's not 27 different catheter approaches, mm -hmm. nor should there be? Oh, oh yes, there are. <laughs> <laughs> True, but you're not going to perform 27 on the same patient. <laughs> I hope not. Oh, well, don't put it back. <laughs> now, Mike, uh, you know, I, I think this is very exciting, but it, as Gorov says, I mean, mitral valve surgery is it's very good. It's held a very, a very high bar. AJACC guidelines, you know, for elective mitral repair in the asymptomatic patient, 95% repair rate, and we can talk about what's a good repair rate. Uh, with less than 1% mortality. Certainly the catheter-based approach, I think we can approach it to 1% or less mortality. But what about this concept that we always hear about? Uh, yes, you can repair it. Is it a good repair? And, and where do you think that's going to fall in, in terms of catheter versus open surgery, even if we can do it well through a small incision, which many groups are doing? Right. So th the first thing I would say is Tom Wynn put up a slide earlier today about a cartoon about a says, I've never had a patient come in the office begging for a sternotomy. Uh, and, and that is true. There's a major message there. And as these less invasive therapies come in, it's going to put more onus on surgery to become less invasive. So minimal access incisions, robotic surgery, et cetera. I think that when you look, you always look at the risk-benefit ratio and, and what is the trade-off for a particular patient. Um, does 85, does uh, every 80-year-old patient with bileaflet disease 
need a complex, minimally invasive bileaflet repair? The answer is probably not. They either can get a replacement um, uh, or they can get a transcatheter uh, approach to that. Right. I, I think kind of like what we really don't know the long-term long -term outcomes of surgery are, I don't think we know what the real durability of mitral valve repair is. Yeah, we know what Tyrone's are, but we don't know what the rest of the world is. So I think one is it'll put a, um, it'll put a lens uh, on what our real surgical outcomes are and our durability. And, and then you take a patient-centered approach to things and say, what is the trade-off that you're willing to accept for, let's just say, less durability? Right. So I, I think that's the, the way you have to think and about it. And it'll continue to evolve, absolutely. Mike makes a good point there. We're really becoming <coughs> focused on patient-centered outcomes and patient preferences. And um, th that's going to be important in the future, especially as we get into the populations, like Mike said, um, <coughs> older people who um, basically just want to feel better. Correct. And, uh, and th those people aren't necessarily interested in extra years of life, and I'm not sure we could ever prove that the, you know, the, the standard therapies we offer now in those people actually do offer extra years of life. But the, the key thing that they're looking at is you know do they feel better? Can they function better? Can they interact with their family and their grandchildren and those kinds of things? And and, and those are the things that we really are centering on more at the FDA as well. Well, and I think to your point is that that's why surgeons need to be staying involved in both open and transcatheter approaches because then you can offer the complete solution to your patient. When you get referred, rather than being handicapped that you're not able to offer one part of therapy based on the patient's needs. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this discussion. We're going to wrap it up. Uh, I think this highlights what was so um, eloquently discussed at the presidential address today, balancing innovation and quality. Uh, and with that, I'll wrap that up. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon uh, at the STS annual meeting and hope to talk to you soon. <laughs>